Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Institute du Fromage Spring Pairing Spectacular. My name is Nathan Aldridge. Uh, I am the manager of education for the Institute du Fromage. So I always tell people it's, it's my job to talk and eat uh, in, in whatever order I feel appropriate. Uh, and I love it. Um, my job is to travel around this country. I work with deli staff, cheesemongers, uh, uh, retail managers, chefs, wait staff, hotels, uh, resorts, everybody to educate on the pleasures of cheese, uh, meats, jams, specialty food in general. So today is a very special day where we all can get together. Uh, all of you hopefully have received your tasting kit filled with delightful goodies. Uh, we're going to have three very special guests. Today is not about me talking. Uh, all of our presenters know I can run my mouth forever, but I'm going to let them talk. Uh, but we're going to have uh, Sheila Flanagan in from Nettle Meadow, Mark Pena O'Brien from Terrapin Ridge, and Pat Ford with Beehive Cheese. Now, they're going to go through and they're going to talk a little bit about their business. They're going to talk a little bit about what inspires them to create. They're going to also talk about the production of these delicious items, and they're going to lead us, the producers, the makers, are going to lead us all in a tasting of the products they included in the tasting kit. And if we're lucky, if we're real lucky, they may talk to us about what their favorite pairings are as well. And before I, I, uh, I get Sheila on, I just want to say that when I'm talking about the pairing spectacular, I don't know if I can pull my board up without spilling everything, but I'm going to try. Oh, 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 so this is my cheese board. I got a little bit of everything on here. So I'm going to be tasting with you. And if you get a chance, make a board too. But a pairing is when you take two, maybe even three or more items that you find pretty good on their own. But when you put them together, they create their own unique, what I like to call dining experience. That means the texture may change, the flavor may change. And we're dealing with things like acidity, saltiness, crunchiness, umami flavors, or something that may make your, your taste buds salivate a little bit more. All of these different attributes are what goes into a good pairing. And I tried to include most of those items in this tasting kit. I think we're probably lacking a little bit of acidity on this board, which is the only thing. I think maybe a pickle or an olive, I'll do better next time. But here you do have the chance. And I invite you all to taste on your own as well. Like, does the caramelized pecan with that sweetness and burnt sugar, how does that act with, with the firmer cheeses, with the kunik, you know, with the fromage blanc? So taste along, have fun, learn about your taste buds today. And it's probably time for me to stop talking. Uh, but again, Continue using this chat feature, ask all the questions you want, and I'm going to pass this over to our first speaker, Sheila. Welcome aboard. Hey, folks. I'm Sheila Flanagan from Nettle Meadow, one of the cheesemakers here. Um, and over here to my right is, uh, in the light, is Renata. She's Hello. our sales manager. Um, today, I sent out the honey lavender fromage blanc, which is always uh, a big favorite this time of year. It really kind of speaks summer and spring. Um, yes, thank you, Nathan. It's this guy right here um, in a little five ounce cup. And that comes sealed so that it keeps its freshness um, over time. We add local Adirondack honeys uh, to that, and we use lavender flowers with which we make a lavender tea. Um, my staff is very mad at me today because I forgot to order the lavender flowers yesterday. They are real lavender flowers. They make a lovely tea with it, and then we mix it all together um, with the honey, with the lavender. No salt, no strange preservatives nothing and that's it's like the most simple of cheeses and so that is the the honey lavender and i just renata was nice enough to bring up one of our uh kunik cookies from the restaurant because nathan was talking about how um how do we like to pair some of these cheeses and i have to say it has been for probably 15 years but one of my favorite 
uh, pairings is to take a, a cookie and you can do a Kunik cookie, which is just a, a sugar cookie with some Kunik in it. Or you can take a Nilla wafer. It's really cheap and easy to use a Nilla wafer. And it looks fancy when you put the little ras piece of raspberry on top. It's really super yummy. The raspberry brings out that acidity that Nathan was talking about that um, the, the cheese itself, at least the honey lavender is, is um, missing. Um, and it's just, it's a wonderful, perfect bite. Um, add a little um, piece of lemon or lime to the top of that. And it just looks like you've been preparing this dessert for your neighbors for, for days. And it's just one of the simplest, easiest, um, you know, most holistic, basic things that you can, that you can offer. And the reason that I like to present our honey lavender fromage blanc when we do one of these um, talks is because it really does epitomize one of the aspects of Nettle Meadow, which is that we really um, make every effort to bring in the freshest milk. This is all goat milk. And there are so many, you know, places that traditionally over time have a really clawing, um, tangy, um, definitely more acidic flavor um, to that older style, more clotted goat milk cheese. Um, and that is the opposite of what our cheese is. And everyone has their own preference in goat cheese and chefs. And I don't think that one is better than, an, uh, than another. It's just um, our style and our preferences versus others. And so what we found is that by using the freshest same day goat milk and by really working hard to make sure that that milk is under mechanized, meaning that we're not driving it through pumps and breaking down um, the various um, uh, molecular aspects of that milk. Uh, so that we're not, as I often uh, say, so that we're not beating it to death. Um, we're just, uh, you know, pouring it, pouring it off simply and then pouring it into our bulk tank simply, uh, pouring it gently into um, our cheese vats, really doing everything that we can to make sure that we're treat treating that milk as delicately as we can so that it makes a uh, fresh flavored cheese that can allow very light flavors like lavender and uh, clover honey to be present in a goat cheese without being overpowering, without being overpowering exactly. So it's, just, it's supposed to be a concept of kind of a very simple balancing between the goat cheese, the honey and the lavender. And I hope that the cheeses that you've all uh, received today um, do represent and show that intention. So, um, so that, that is that. I don't know if, you know, I jumped right into cheese because Nathan got me all excited about pairings and cheese and pecans and caramel. And, and I have to say some of these things, I, I just came flying in from a food safety audit. We all love food safety audits, right? So you can see I'm a little red and a little little looking like maybe I just came in from the uh, the pool or something, but it's just that that effect that food safety audits have on all of us. <laughs> Make us know we're alive. Um, anyways, so I uh, I just I came flying in here and uh, I tried the uh, Terrapin Farms uh, hot pepper bacon jam and the blueberry bourbon pecan jam. Oops. And I, I get again, I think that that uh, that blueberry bourbon pecan jam, just a tiny bit of that even would be a really nice addition. Again, on that basic Nilla wafer with the honey lavender fromage blanc. It's just, it's a gentle cheese and the blueberry is so present in that jam. It it also would be a nice combination like like the um, the raspberry that I that I often put on top. So so that is the honey lavender. Um, I'm supposed to be paying attention to the chat in case anyone has questions. Um, You're doing then, good. Everybody's just talking about how wonderful the cheese is. Cool. Everything's cool. great. That's that's what I love to hear. 
Um, and so, so that is the Honey Lavender. It was a Silver Sophie winner back in the days when I could still remember dates. So I want to say 2008, 2009. Um, and then um, the other cheese that we provided was our, our smallest Kunik, the Kunik Mini. And that's a little three and a half ounce with uh, the easy, um, very scannable um, UPC code on it so that it is super easy to just grab and go um, from the highest end store to, you know, your local corner shop. So the Kunik is a cheese that we have worked on perfecting and adding to um, in, in over the last 18 plus years. Um, Pat and I were just talking about uh, where Nettle Meadow was 18 years ago when his uh, partner made his way out to the Adirondacks right before uh, I stumbled upon the farm and and purchased it. Um, and he will he'll be able to tell you that story much better than I can. He'll 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 tell you all the high points. <laughs> um, and so the um, the Kunik Mini is something that uh, was kind of just a, a more of a um, a concept of the imagination back then and has become kind of bloomed as it is a bloomy rind more and more into the pun intended. one yeah pun intended uh at, into the beautiful triple creme uh bloomy rind that it is today um yeah so it was it was top 20 in the world um you can see i have my sales manager talking in my ear so i remember those high points it was one it was named um, or recognized as one of the top 20 cheeses at the World Cheese Championships last year. That was very exciting. Um, a very good day in the life for any artisan cheesemaker. Um, but of course, it is just a day in the life because there are so many cheeses that uh, deserve and take those spots, um, both in U.S. Cheese Championships and World Cheese Championships every year. Most of um, those are have been developed since the 17th century right at that time so we so we do have some wonderful american cheeses with us today and so the kunik just being one of those we have uh there's the uh the kunik cheese has always been a combination of goat milk and cow cream um the cows that we raise um for our cheeses are all jersey cows so very high butter fat a little bit lower on production side, kind of like a, a La Mancha goat is lower on the amount of production, but higher on the butter fat. And that's what the Jersey cow does as well. So it makes this really lovely, uh, super, super creamy. Um, Streamlined. Yes, very tasty uh, cheese. And so uh, it is with, with much happiness that I realized that we do have um, as Nathan said, tell us what your favorite way to pair some of your favorite cheeses are. And Kunik by far is one of my favorite cheeses. And my favorite pairing, uh, honest to goodness, is with a hot pepper jelly. So today we have a really outstanding hot pepper. What could be possibly be better than hot pepper jelly? Hot pepper bacon jam. So, um, so we have that here today. And um, I tried the uh, jam on its own, but I am quite certain that this is going to be a delicious bite. And it really is. Because with the, the butteriness and the saltiness of the Kunik, but then you, on top of that, you layer that little bit of spice and the sweetness of, and yeah, and the smokiness of the bacon, which is one extra element that you don't usually get with the hot pepper jelly. The combination of those five things coming together, it doesn't really even need a cracker or anything. I really truly believe that that is a, a perfect bite. So that that is a, a marriage of foods made in heaven, in my opinion. Um, the Kunik Mini um, GFI sells it um, in this this lovely little size, which makes it so easy for retailers to work with. But they also sell the button size, which is the eight to ten ounce uh, wheel. Also, uh, really nice. Chefs love working with it, but um, it's also nice. You know, this is a nice nice size for 
um, a, you know, a couple on a Friday night, but if you're having the family over for a gathering, you might want to go for the, the button size. Um, if you sell a lot of party type uh, cheese boards, as we do here, uh, those eight, nine ounce wheels uh, go really nicely. I know Nathan's going to be happy to hear. We had said that our goal was July 1st, and that still is my goal, but I'm not feeling as optimistic as I was about um, a, a nine ounce exact weight Kunick button, which I think would make life easier for almost everyone on the Zoom call today. So that is sometime this summer before we hit the madness of the fourth quarter, the Kunick button will be an exact weight. It's just it's tough, and I think that's a, a good jumping off point for me to say it's tough because we are still a very artisan company. Um, we still pour every batch by hand. We still train every employee how to pour that batch of cheese. We still have to explain to them that if they pour it to here, it's going to be too large. If they pour it to here, it's going to be too small and we have to pour it perfectly. And then and then there's all of the uh, truly artisan um, interpretations that we have to do throughout the year. In the summertime, we have to pour that cheese higher because um, all there's, there's a thing called uh, winter yield, which when you pour a cheese into a mold, it stays higher in the summertime. There's all sorts of different things going on with where the animals are in their milking cycle, um, what the barometric pressure is doing, what the humidity is doing, how that affects the, the heat in the cheese plant where the culture is added and what that does to production on a seasonal level. And here we are in the Adirondacks where it gets very warm, as you can tell from my face today, and it gets freezing, freezing, freezing cold. Um, and so we have to work daily to respond to those changes. And sometimes in uh, May, we're still in May, it is 24 degrees. And sometimes in May, it is 92 degrees and we have to be able to make that Kunick exactly the same for your customers, whether we're having a 92 degree day or a 24 degree day. And, um, and it is not a perfect science. It is a very carefully crafted artisan experience done by a group of young and not so young people anymore, um, but we've got a great group of youngsters coming along who are passionate about cheese and we all just toil and help to teach each other um, as as those um, temperature changes humidity changes milk changes occur so that we can produce uh, the exact same experience with a honey lavender fromage blanc on may 31st as we do on december 31st and that's um it's actually, believe it or not, easier to do with the fromage blanc piece as it is, uh, it's even harder to do with our Kunick or our Adirondack or uh, our three sisters, some of our more bloomy rind cheeses, because there you struggle more with um, densities and consistencies and dryness that becomes more evident if you don't have a super passionate group of people around you at all times, just making sure, like just as we started this call, one of the cheesemakers came up and said, it's so warm today. Do you want me to use this much culture or that much culture? It is not a science and there is not a robot that um, on a particular type of cheese. And, you know, we just, we are a, a truly nuanced artisan organization here uh, making cheese very, very much the way that pro people probably did in 1900, except for we have a little bit fancier equipment, but so many of the concepts are very much the same. And I find myself reading a lot of history these days and appreciating, you know, some of those seasonal and uh, struggles and pandemic struggles and, um, you know, uh, equipment and uh, staffing struggles that all of those cheesemakers have had in those decades and centuries before us. So um, I, 
think I have a few more minutes. I just want to also say for those of you who don't know, who want to give your customers kind of that, that all around experience that don't know a lot about us. Um, I'll just tell you a few of the, the things that make us um, different, unique, maybe special. Um, we started out um, with a group of, of 36 pretty, pretty sorry uh, little goat, little goats. And um, we retired more than half of them in the first 10 days because they were in pretty rough shape. And with that whole, oh my God, these goats need to be retired experience, our animal sanctuary was born. And so since that time, um, our animal sanctuary has really grown and grown and grown and taken on um, much of a life of its own. So uh, we work really hard to make sure that every employee here feels like they are respected and are making a living wage and are you know, um, doing well. But we also work very, very hard to make sure that our animals have um, an existence that doesn't depend necessarily on their ability to produce. And we have some creatures that are born with yeah, you know, all sorts of disabilities and health problems. And so, you know, we work with them. And those girls that have worked in our production programs or on our production, because as time has gone by, we've grown so much that our original farm is only a sanctuary now. And we have 15 other farm families that we work with that work with the uh, production goats, production sheep, uh, production cows, and then all those creatures as they have a health problem or a, um, an accident or something happens, they come back to the farm to retire. If they're born with a, an, an issue, we just had one this year, which is a great example of kind of what we do at Nettle Meadow. One of our farmers uh, was kidding, had a whole bunch of kids within uh, one week, and then some sort of weasel or fox or something got into his kid barn and attacked um, a couple of his smaller goat kids. And these were two boys. And so in kind of the world of farming, there's really nothing as invaluable to a farmer as a little baby boy goat. Um, but he called me up and he said, Sheila, do you want to try to do something with these guys that they're really in rough shape? And I said, oh, it'll be a great experience for the staff. Let's bring them up and try to work with it. Well, in reality, they were in such rough shape that they had to go to my partner, Lorraine, and she kind of worked with them day and night for uh a week and a half at least until it became clear that one of the little boys had to have one of his legs removed in order to survive. And so now those two fellows, Harvey and Freddie, will live out their days on uh, the sanctuary as, as two of the greeters. And it's not that they don't have an existence. They do. They run up to all of the customers that come and uh, tour the farm. Our farm is open from 10 to 4 every day. And they're wonderful, you know, they're wonderful greeters. It's, it's, uh, there, there's always some group of youngsters that had an issue, orthopedic or uh, some sort of physical problem. And then there's all the retirees, kind of the old crotchety kind of, you know, goats and sheep and cows and horses and whatnot that will, you know, come up and pester people for an apple or whatever as well. There's, you know, the sheriffs now drop off everything from pot belly pigs to beyond. But that's one of the things that makes us different. Uh, I know I digressed a lot and I'm running up against my time, but there's that. There's the fact that um, we do a tremendous amount of triple crumbs, which is, you know, if if the sanctuary story wasn't enough to prove to you all that we're crazy, then the <laughs> fact that we still make a lot of triple crumbs in this time where the cheapest costs. gallon of cream, even in a, it, using mass volumes of it, is a $20 gallon of cream uh, in New York State, um, then that certainly is proof that we are crazy, that we still do this. And then the last thing is we kind of, because winters are what they are up here in the Adirondacks and we get bored because they no one will let me ski because I am hurt myself sitting down very often. Um, so we do all sorts of crazy stuff and we've gotten used to doing, um, 
lots of tea infusions and um, booze infusions. And so lots of booze. It's very, it's very <laughs> frustrating for Renata, who's no. just off off camera making comments here because um, she's like less cheese, less smaller category, uh, cat catalog, Sheila, and every January, but, I'm so bored that, well, you but know. That, that said, I'll just make this one comment quickly that um, because we have such a large catalog, when things started opening up and people wanted to see new and different things, you know, our catalog is so vast. It's, it was over 40. It's now over 30 items. We just we just edited a few things that um, that it, it allowed people to actually move into and keep us in front of people. Um, and add to their their cheese offerings. And I think it was actually kind of invaluable. So I, I was kind of right, but kind of wrong at the same time. And the other thing that, you know, Sheila is a mad scientist and she always comes up with something fun. Um, we're, we're going deep with Kunik because it's such a cornerstone cheese for us. Um, and uh, I think that uh, coming up end of June or so, uh, we're playing with uh, Kunik Blue which I think could be really fantastic. Yeah. So we have Kunik, we have Amber Kunik, which is a wash Kunik. We, we added truffle. And then you also have the possibility yes. of a blue, which I think could be really great. Yes. So that's all I'm going to say. Now I know you need to go. <laughs> no, it's all right. I just, I didn't want to take any of, of Mark or Pat's time, but, but yeah, I just, uh, uh, we do have, we have uh, now a nice little family of Kuniks for, so for those that like, uh, this Kunik, I, I I recommend that maybe you try some of the others. Uh, I know that GFI carries a lot of these things and also uh, works with people that are looking for, you know, something special. So um, what more can I say? I'm happy to answer any questions. I see a lot of lovely uh, comments here that I really appreciate. And uh, thank you, Deb. Yeah, Deb, I didn't realize you were going to be on this call. That's great. Um, so, um, yeah. Uh, any questions? I'm happy to answer them. If I'm if I'm not here because I'm I'm running off to another uh, call, um, uh, or not, uh, another I have to do a talk down at the Adirondack Folk School because I'm their their cheese person down there. Um, then I'm sure Renata can answer any questions at all. So just uh, thanks again, Nathan, for including us. This is always such a nice uh, event and get to see so many uh, passionate cheese faces that I, you know, it's, uh, it's an important thing to do. And I, I thank you for doing it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for being part of it. Thank you for, I know you're busy. You've got, you're running a business, you're running a farm, you're making cheese, and yet you still take time out to join us. So I just, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. And the community is so important. It really yes. is. And, and I just want to talk to everybody out there too, to really point out like a lot of the messages that were coming from Sheila and the fact that, you know, taking care of these animals, you know, as our generations grow and we're dealing with Gen Z and, you know, all that, we're, we're dealing with a customer base that wants to know these stories. We're dealing with a customer base now that cares about these stories. They want to know where this, their food comes from. They want to know how animals are treated and they want to hear the stories of this. So get behind Nettle Meadow and start supporting this cheese and other cheesemakers like Sheila out there that is doing a good job, artists and handcrafted cheeses, doing it in the old way where you get, and everybody tasted it. Everybody thinks Kunik's delicious, right? So like this is all the hard work and effort and love and mad artistry, uh, mad science artistry that goes into it. This is the story. This is the life. This is why we are all in specialty food. So thank you again, Sheila. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, I hope all. you have a great talk tonight. Thanks. We'll see you thank later. You. And I'm going to welcome uh, to the screen now. Hey, we got Mark Pena O'Brien from Terrapin Ridge. Uh, welcome aboard. And we can't wait to learn more about these absolutely amazing jams. Thanks, Nathan. And we appreciate being able to be part of it. This is such a great opportunity. We love being able to talk to everybody today. And Sheila, that was super fun. Thank you so much for the details on the farm and everything. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I'm in love with your Kunik. So I'll, it'll be on, in my fridge always. <laughs> um, great to meet everybody. We're really happy to be here. I'm going to share my screen here. And we will get started talking about Terrapin Ridge. Okay. So Terrapin Ridge Farms, 
We I'm going to go through a little bit about our history, introduce you to um, some of the people that are the star players in our company. How did we get where we're going or where we are and where we're going? And then also how we develop some of our products. Um, I have uh, Claire O'Donnell on with me as well. Claire is our marketing director. She's on there too, joining me, and she'll be uh, jumping in from time to time. But we're Terrapin Ridge. We started in 1997 um, with a uh, woman from Chicago. She belonged to a family um, owned business in Chicago, third generation, and had a keen interest in culinary. She um, was kind of the rise of the 90s. The specialty food movement was really gaining steam. And um, she wanted to start her own business after she graduated from the Culinary Institute of America. She, uh, there is a Terrapin Ridge. She lived in Illinois or lives there still and uh, lived in an area where there is a series of hills and they are called Terrapin Ridge. So she decided to name the company Terrapin Ridge, which is how we got the company that we have today. Um, the brand had done well. She had done well for a number of years, but then some of her passion for it kind of started to die out. And it uh, wasn't really doing what she wanted to do in terms of the company. And it worked out perfectly that Mary O'Donnell, who's our CEO, the owner of our company, Mary had run a couple of other specialty food companies and grown them from very small companies to larger companies. And she really had a passion for creating her own brand. And she saw a diamond in the rough. When she looked around for something that she wanted to purchase and really make her own, she found Terrapin Ridge and she said, we can really do something special. Uh, Mary has a passion for food. When you meet her uh, from the first day that I ever met her, she has a passion for food, but she also has a passion for fun. Her um, focus is entertaining and having a good time, which is what we do all day long at Terrapin Ridge. We love to eat and we love to have people over. So uh, some of us like to cook, some of us don't like to cook, but everybody loves to eat. And uh, company-wide, we all enjoy sitting down and having a good meal. I think it's one of those things that um, really enhances life, right? And after the pandemic, it really became um, something special to be able to see people again and have people over and open a jar of something and have something really great to serve. So Mary's passion for that and her focus on having fun and entertaining people, which comes from her family history, um, was there from the start. She had a one half part-time employee. She utilized a third-party logistics uh, company to do the shipping. I was an independent food rep and actually met Mary shortly after she bought the company and um, met with her at her original little office, which was literally the size of a closet. It was one of those offices where you could turn your chair and you were knee to knee with the other person working and you could throw a conference call really easily just by turning around your chair. So it was one of those kinds of offices, very small, um, but it actually started to grow from there. And I came to work for her shortly after that. We changed offices three times. We bought our own office now. We bought our own warehouse. Um, it's been just a fun, fun ride of growth over the last 12 years, 13 years. We started with 15 SKUs when Mary bought the company. Three of them are still around, three of our good old sellers, but we're over 100 SKUs now. We do everything from gift sets, to um, dressings, dips, mustards, jams, sauces, aiolis. We've expanded the line in all directions. We've even, even added food service. And at the same time, we've really held on to our sense of family. It is like working with your family. And actually for Claire, it is working with her family because Claire is Mary's daughter. She's our uh, director of marketing. She came on board and really brought something fresh in terms of uh, social media. We're up over 30,000 followers now. And one of the cool things about our social media presence is that we tend to skew younger. So the base of people following us, it tends to be that next generation, Nathan, that you were talking about. They're passionate about good food. They're more savvy than the generation before them in terms of taste. They've been exposed to way more. 
And so really they're looking for something new and different. They're also not necessarily cooking as much as maybe the generation prior to them. So being able to open something, put it out with crackers, an amazing cheese, some charcuterie, for them, that's like the gold standard of being able to start their entertainment. So parties are all centering around boards, which obviously has just exploded over the last few years. And uh, we've always um, embraced that. Our love of cheese drives a lot of the products we create. Our love of charcuterie our love of wine. Those are the kinds of things that drive some of our process in creating product. Uh, Mary comes from a large family and they were known in their neighborhood as entertainers. And again, I've been to many family parties at Mary's house. And let me tell you, she throws a party like nobody else. Um, and she really has that commitment and it goes down through everybody in the company to love what you do. I think we all do this because we love it. And it's so much fun. It's such a blast to be in food. I never feel like I work a day because it's it's so much fun to be in food. It's unlike anything else. We're not selling widgets. We're not selling insurance. We're actually selling something really cool, which I love. Mary loves it as well. And she loves being able to make it easy for people, especially if they don't know, like if they've never done anything in terms of entertaining. So our inspiration comes from all over the place. We um, have what's called an open door concept. Anybody in the company can go out to eat, try a new cheese, go to someone's house and try it, something they've created and bring back ideas to Mary. Um, some of our best products, the stories of how the idea came about came through one of these pro uh, product discussions. We sit around and talk about the things we've had to eat. Um, I remember one time when I had a really good chicken and waffle and I ended up with a spiced maple syrup. I'm like, this is incredible. Ask the restaurant and the chef actually makes it from scratch. So I went back to Mary and said, hey, we should do a hot maple syrup. It didn't end up coming together, but that's how we bring those ideas into Mary. And we have a chef, our chef Chuck, he works wonders. You bring him the ideas, you explain the flavor profiles you're going for, and the process just, just gets going. One of the things we're known for is building flavor on top of flavor on top of flavor. So our products should taste like a good wine or a great cheese or a great cured meat. When you have those things, you usually have multiple moments in your tasting process. Some of the cheeses we already tasted, Sheila's cheeses, amazing depth in those cheeses, especially like the honey lavender, amazing. I'm in love with the Kunick. It brings nutty flavor, butter, all kinds of stuff, a little salt. So those are the kinds of things we think about when we build a product. Um, Mary, she came up with a cilantro lime ranch dressing, which is our number one dressing. Before anyone else had a cilantro lime ranch, we had it first. Mary was doing a salad at an airport and it had fresh cilantro and pieces of lime sitting on the side. And she thought somebody should put that in ranch dressing. And that's how we ended up creating the ranch dressing that we have. I came up, or I came up with, I didn't come up with the hot pepper bacon jam. I went out to visit an olive oil store that was carrying our products. This is a long time ago, 2014. And they had a little condiment that was basically chopped bacon in a jar. And it had a little bit of seasoning on it. And I thought it was a little bit of an odd condiment, but I brought it back to the, to the office. And I said, you know, we should take bacon and put it into something. And Mary said, absolutely. We should take our hot uh, pepper jelly and put bacon, add bacon into it and see how many pieces of flavor, how many pieces of uh, different flavors we can get in that product. And we asked Chuck to go at it. And he went at it and our hot pepper bacon jam was born which is our number one seller across the board. We've actually, it's so popular, we've dovetailed into multiple other recipes. We do a bacon pepper dip, we do a bacon aioli, we do a smoky maple bacon mustard that's out of this world. Our bacon products just uh, have taken off. Our bacon tomato ranch, unbelievable, BLT in a, in a bottle. So some of those flavor profiles that we came out of with some of the popular items like bacon, uh, hot pepper bacon jam have really driven us in a lot of ways. Um, the 
other thing that uh, is great with the bacon jam is that it got us into the next step of the process, which is uh, food service, adding some food service. Um, so just to give you an idea a little bit about what we do and what we do every day and how much fun we have, um, we're up to 40 people now, but we still have a blast. Our warehouse team is unbelievable. We love them. Our team in the office, unbelievable. We get together, we do luncheons, we do holiday dinners, we do Halloween is a, we do a tradition. Halloween is one of our traditional dress up times. And it's just, it's, it's so much fun to go do a show with people that feel like your family. It's really an amazing experience to work for a company that feels like your family. And, and to see it grow so much and still it hasn't changed. And also how much fun we bring to the table helps us come up with better products because we want our customers having fun and we want our customers entertaining. Um, which brings us to the next thing, which is our two things on the board. Um, let me just switch off of here for a second. All right, can you see me again? I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Um, yeah, so now we're um, going to go digging into some taste uh, profiles. Like I said, we love to play around with things. We, um, we have a number of products that go into liquors. So we do a bourbon, the hot pepper, or the blueberry bourbon pecan jam. We messed with tequila. We've worked with Grand Marnier. We do a cranberry Grand Marnier relish that's out of this world. Um, we do an amber ale jam with pineapple. So we love to mess around with flavors and do something different and interesting. Um, you'll never see us do like a traditional grandma's blueberry jam. That's just not us. We would rather play with something that's really kind of crazy and see where we can go with it. Um, one of my favorite, I have two favorite tastes on the board. One would be Sheila's Kunik which is amazing, either with the hot pepper bacon jam or the blueberry bourbon pecan jam. I like to take, um, Nathan put the Bella Maria pecans, the candy pecans. So what I was doing last night when I dug into the box was I took some Kunik and the candy pecan and a little bit of the blueberry bourbon pecan jam right on top. Get that going. Mm. Nice. Perfect bite. The blueberries, the kunik, the smoothness of the kunik and the salt of the kunik, the sweetness of the pecans paired with the uh, blueberry bourbon, unbelievable. We use real Kentucky bourbon. We get asked that all the time. Um, I also loved the honey lavender from Netto Meadow. Netto Meadow. Uh, the honey lavender was really cool with the blueberry because it's almost like you can imagine the bee and the honey and then the lavender fields and then the blueberry fields behind it. It was just such a fun bite. My other favorite bite, and you're going to hear from Pat in a second, is the beehive queen portini mushroom. The portini mushroom one, so good with the hot pepper bacon jam. It has the nutty um, earthiness of, a, of the mushroom, which just and the smokiness of the bacon jam, it just pairs like it's a dream. I, I love it. And Pat, that porcini, so good. Delicious. So just to go back to Sharon a second, I'll wrap up. How am I doing on time, Nathan? You're good. You've got uh, about 10 more minutes. Cool. Okay, so when we talk about developing products, we like to stack flavors, like I said before. So you're going to see us launch some things that may or may not work together. We launched, for instance, we launched a Harissa, Aeoli, Dynamite. So good. But the timing was weird because um, uh, the um, um, COVID hit. And when COVID hit, it kind of stopped the momentum of Harissa. Paris is a North African spice blend, really good, smoky, got some earthiness to it. And when we launched it, we thought, well, this will be great. And it turned out it didn't work out. It wasn't the right time. 
we'll probably end up taking it away and relaunching it again when Harissa really starts to take it off. But I know like with Cheese, even they mentioned it, uh, Sheila mentioned it, they're playing around with all kinds of things, cheese and liquors and alcohol, cheese and seasoning, um, flavors that go together, or at least to present them to customers and see what they think. Um, it's one of those things with the hot pepper bacon jam where people said to us, um, can you make it in a dip form? We'd really love to have bacon jam, but we want it in a dip form so we can open and serve it with crudite or um, uh, crostinis. And we said, okay, we'll switch it around a little bit and we'll take it from a pepper base to a tomato base and we'll use black pepper in there, um, which gives it a whole different flavor profile. The, you got sweet, but the heat is different. When you switch over to black pepper, the heat is gonna be different, different on that one. Um, we did the same thing when we developed like our spicy chipotle is a good old product for us. And that one has orange juice in it. It really mimics a lot of um, the, the kind of an old Latin type of marinade where you would have orange juice or a cit citrus element. And so our spicy chipotle sauce actually has the smoky smokiness of a chipotle with the orange juice, the citrus of uh, citrus note in it of orange juice. We love playing around with those kinds of layered flavors. Um, Bacon Jam also dovetailed us into food service, like I mentioned before. And this would be for um, delis that are looking to create specialty sandwiches. Um, maybe they're using a specialty cheese, a specialty turkey, and then they want something to go on that that will elevate that sandwich. They literally said to us, you have to put this in gallons for us. Um, restaurants that make a lot of things out of scratch may decide that one thing that they that they really want is their secret sauce and they go with bacon jam. They put it on their smoky cheddar burger and they make it their secret sauce. It um, saves them time in the kitchen, which everybody's hurting for um, employees. So it's actually saving some restaurant steps and they can elevate a dish without spending a lot of extra money. Um, it gives us a chance to also get the product in front of people and get the flavor profile out there. We have some delis that do it on a featured sandwich with one of their featured cheeses and their featured meat. And then they put up the jars right on the uh, counter and they cross sell the bacon jam. They say, if you loved our turkey bacon uh, panini, you're going to love taking some bacon jam home. And they do a cross sell opportunity there. I use it in everything I want to add some uh, flavor to tuna salad, chicken salad. People would just look at you and go, what did you do with this? I don't understand. It's sweet. It's smoky. It's got so much depth of flavor. Um, going to the blueberry bourbon pecan jam, same difference or same deal. We use it in a lot of applications. We encourage people to glaze with it. We encourage people to use it in meat applications like pork. It's great on a pork tenderloin. It's also wonderful out on a charcuterie board with cured meats, um, goes really well there, but it can also dovetail into breakfast boards. The butter boards that are out there go really well with it as well. Um, so all the different board options that are, that are tying things together in terms of entertainment, this is one of the superstars. Um, I love it with the honey lavender. I would encourage you to taste it with a little bit of the honey lavender. And I actually use these apricot uh, macadamia crackers. And just a little bit of the blueberry on that honey lavender comes through so nice. The fun thing about stacking the flavors, I mean, that one just says to me, open meadow, honey, the smell of lavender, and then you get blueberries, which is so summery. It's just such a cool bite. And then there's a little bit of nuttiness and the earthiness of the pecans. It's just great. And there are products that I love demoing because everybody that steps up to the table absolutely loves them. Um, great pairings. Um, the fun thing with blueberry bourbon is the goat cheeses work really well with the blueberry bourbon. I make a goat cheese log with the blueberry bourbon pecan jam and then roll it in pecans. So good. Demo that one all the time that way. Really, really delish. 
Also, I make a glaze with it just by um, adding um, some of the, uh, you can take the blueberry bourbon and do fresh blueberries with it and it, and cook it. It'll make it down into a glaze. Um, great for putting over top of all kinds of things. Really, really fun. Thanks so much for letting me come and present, Nathan. We appreciate it a ton. I hope everybody had a chance to kind of learn a little bit of more about us. Um, I don't know if we had any questions pop up in the chat. Claire posted uh, the Juicy Lucy Burger recipe out there, you guys. You got to try it. So, so good. Yeah, I didn't see a lot of questions, but I did see a lot of praise. Um, <laughs> everybody's just really into these. And uh, this is absolutely amazing, Mark. And I... I, was, I thought I'd caught on to something when I was like, oh, this blueberry pecan goes so well with the with the speck and the chorizo. I was like, I tried like a blueberry goat log this year with summer sausage. And I was like, blueberry and meat, but this yeah. is so much better. It absolutely goes with charcuterie. A lot of fun. Yeah, we love it. Charcuterie is our wheelhouse. We really, I mean, playing with, it's where we like to play. It's our playground because we love uh, uh, cured meats and cheeses just pair so well. And when we design products, literally we're thinking about it. Um, it drives a lot of what we do. We, we just love it. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much. And everybody, uh, like I said before, when we were talking about Sheila, I, I could have called today uh, the day of mad scientists, uh, <laughs> as well as just pairings, because it seems like everybody's brains are just looking to create. Pat's going to talk about creating in a minute. It's like, uh, but that's what you get. These are these businesses. All of you are designed around creating something unique, um, you know, family driven, whether it be a small farm working out of, uh, you know, a 40 people, you know, uh, coming together to put this. This is this is amazing. These aren't huge conglomerates. These aren't giant, giant businesses. These are families that, that have gone through and pushed us through. These are the stories again. And I'm Sorry, I get on my little soapboxes. I get passionate about it. But everybody out there, these are who we want to support. This is what we want to get out there. And this is what your customers are going to be looking for. So, Mark, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate you. Um, hang tight. And anybody out there, get some questions. I know we all love it. I love to hear the, the, that we love everything. But One thing I was going to tell everybody, yeah. Pat's got a coffee cheese that when you pair it with the blueberry bourbon, it's like a cup of coffee and a blueberry muffin. I can't wait for you to try it when, when, you, when you get to Pat, but because his, his coffee cheese is so cool. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Mark. All righty. And that segues right into, uh, ladies and gentlemen, introducing Pat Ford of Beehive Cheese. Thank you, Nathan, and thank you, Mark, and thank you, Sheila. But um, along those lines, I mean, we would not be here without you guys. You guys are the cheesemongers. You're the front line, and you're telling our stories. And it's so cool to get to know you so that you can tell our stories to our customers. So we thank you very much. I am so excited. I was so excited for the blueberry pecan bourbon jam. But um, about two hours ago, I grabbed my box out of the cooler and I put it closer in another cooler closer to me. And it happened to be next to, to the take home rack. And so I went back there about an hour and a half ago to grab my cheese and the box is totally empty. <laughs> we'll send you a whole case. <laughs> we'll get but you I found a whole <laughs> office and I said, who took my stuff? And everybody <laughs> took it back. So Anyway, these products are awesome and they are they were pillaged and per they were stolen, but I was able to find most of them, but I wanted to taste that blueberry. I couldn't ever round that one up. So Nettle Metal, it was so funny. My my business partner is my brother in law, and he called me up about 20 years ago and he said, Let's quit our jobs and go make cheese. And we both kind of laughed, like, oh, that's a great idea. And um my sister worked for Delta for 37 years, and they they said there's this crazy little goat farm on Ad, in Adirondack Park, New York, and they are on a plane like the next day. They flew out there and visited Nettle Meadow, 
And it was amazing. And it, it's so coincidental that Sheila was on because that was one of the beginnings of our business. And he came back, Tim came back. He says, first off, I don't want to move to New York. I'm a native Utah. And I don't necessarily love goats. I don't know how to raise them. I don't know anything about that. So anyway, long story short, we decided to stay close to our roots here in Utah. But um, Beehive, Utah is the Beehive State, thus the name Beehive Cheese. And we went up to Utah State University. They're one of like five of the top uh, dairy science universities in the country. And we told them what we were wanting to do, and they proceeded to try to talk us out of it because they were like, what are you thinking? In, in the Cache Valley up in Logan, there are three cheese makers up there. And between the three of them, they make about a million pounds of cheese a day. And um, we're like, no, we're not wanting to make that type of cheese. We want to make artisan cheese. And if you think about it, this was part of our our hopes, I mean, we've seen it in char chocolate and jams and charcuterie and bread and wine and beer and all of the above. There was a renaissance of all of these things and the kind of the renaissance for cheese happened around 2000 to 2005. I mean, there are some amazing peers of ours, Beechers, Jasper Hill, Point Reyes, Sweetgrass Dairy, us. I mean, there's a whole list of a bunch of us that jumped in about 2000 to 2005. And it was just this beautiful renaissance. I've always said the fact that you're local does not give you a rite of passage onto my menu or into my store. But if your product is as good or better than the stuff I've been buying from Europe, then heck yes, buy local. And so, I mean, the Kumik won one of the top five cheeses or 20 cheeses in the world. David Gremmel's from Rogue Crem Creamery, the Rogue River Blue was the number one cheese in the world at the World Cheese Awards two years ago. And so there are people out there outside of the United States that are taking note that, oh my gosh, these Americans have kind of figured it out and they're making some amazing cheeses. And I'll give you an example. So our Barely Buzz, which we will taste, we went to Utah State. They helped us develop our base recipe. It's called Promontory. It's just a nice Irish, Irish cheddar. But there's a lot of really nice Irish cheddars out there. And so we decided we need to do something a little more interesting than just a white cheddar. And Tim said, well, we put cream in coffee. Why not put coffee on cream? And we tried it and we liked it. And we went to the Portland American Cheese Society in 2006. We had a three pound wheel of it. We took it around. We had some people tasting it a little bit. And a guy from... Uh, Central Market in Texas, tasted it and he said, could you have this ready for holiday? And we're like, we've made three pounds of it. Anyway, we made some cheese um, from the very first batch of cheese that we made, barely buzzed. We put a wheel of side and we entered it the next year in Burlington, Vermont, Vermont. And we end up taking first place with this crazy coffee cheese. And they were all saying, who are these yahoos from Utah? And don't they know you can't put coffee on cheese? And it, it's it's just so fun. We were, my wife and I were at a dinner in Scottsdale and there were two sommeliers at dinner. And one of them was just pretty much full of himself. And he was using all these elaborate descriptive words. And he was just trying to just, he was, he was so impressive with his vocabulary, but he was telling you how you had to enjoy something. And his buddy was there and he said, oh, shut up. If you like it, I don't care if there's a, a protocol, just try it. And so Barely Buzzed is that way. It's kind of like, I don't even know if I want to try that. We had a judge after the Burlington, um, we took first place in 2006. He came out and he talked to my brother-in-law and he said, I didn't want to even taste your cheese. He's one of the judges. I certainly didn't want to like your cheese. But you gave me no other choice to vote for your cheese for first place for the category. And so, you know, these Europeans, for instance, have been so steeped in tradition that you can't put coffee on cheese or else they'll hang you because that's not OK to do. But then when you taste it, you say, oh, OK, well, that tastes pretty good. 
And our one of our fears was that Barely Buzz was going to be a flash in the pan. It was going to kind of go away over over a year or two. And then we progressively won first place like five consecutive years in a row. And now if we are fortunate enough to get an American original cheese like Humboldt Fog or like you say, Bay, Bay, um, Rogue River Blue, it will be Barely Buzz. That's what people know us for. This pairing um, for me, Mark, you hit it on the head. I love the Barely Buzz with the Spec and the Pecan. That to me was fantastic. But again, the Barely Buzz has such a rich roast. It almost has a kind of grandma's burnt pot roast taste to it. it has, it's just very robust, very meaty. And it's just the sweetness of the jam and the sweetness of the pecan and the smokiness for me was the rest of our same lines. I tried the kumik with the speck and the pecan, and it was equally as fantastic, but completely different. And it's so fun that you can have many components that are similar, but that taste completely different. So let me share my screen and I'll show you a couple of pictures of the creamery. Do you guys have any, if you have any, have any questions, you guys jump in and ask questions while I'm showing some pictures. We good? All right, so actually this is where we live. I was riding my mountain bike just last night along this ridge. So we live in a beautiful place. We're in the mountains of Utah, about 30 miles north of Salt Lake. And I, when Sheila was talking about the weather and the complexities of trying to make cheese, when last summer we had the hottest summer on record, we had 36 days over 100 degrees, which is very hot for Utah because we're at about 5,000 feet here. So that's super hot. And then last winter, we had our ski resorts in the mountains had 900 inches of snow. That's the biggest snow we've ever had in the history of Utah, 900 inches. So anyway, it's pretty tricky to try to get your milk and everything else all in the right order. So beehive cheese, this is our dairy, our employees. There's my brother-in-law, he's my partner. So it's been a beautiful partnership. He's the ops guy, the operations guy, the finance guy, and I've always been the marketing guy. So we both have very distinctive different strengths. And we started making cheese. There's my sister on the first day that we made cheese in 2005. This was, it's hard work making cheese, but come here, Avery. This is my daughter, Avery, and as you can see on the screen, this is her when she was making cheese and then she grew up and now she sells our cheese and she's awesome. But it's been so fun. The other kids in the picture, there's Britt, my nephew, my other daughter, my nephew, my cousin, or my niece, my other son. So it's very much a family operation. Lots of fun. First ribbon we got was for Barely Buzzed. We've won many awards since, but I want to just try to Barely Buzzed. I've already told you the story of that. That's the cheese that put us on the map because it was different. Um, it was interesting. It was fun. When we first started making cheese, when people would describe our cheese as interesting, I kind of I kind of almost took offense to that because it was like, well, is it good? Do you love it? And 90% of people that would describe our cheese said it was interesting. And it's kind of like, well, your wife's kind of pretty or, you know, interesting. What does that mean? But we've grown to embrace interesting because if you, we sell so much cheese to caterers, for instance, because they'll put it on a cheese plate with some, with some strawberries and some, you know, some prosciutto, whatever. And people are just drawn to it because it's so unique, so different, so interesting. So we hey, have, Dad, yes. I don't mean to interrupt you. We have several Please. questions right now. Oh, good. Let's board. Ask, let's ask. Make sure you had time to address those. The first one is what category did Barely Buzz win your first year? They didn't know where the crap to put us because it was this rubbed rind. What did they do? Where do we put this? 
It was in flavored cheddars. And at the time there was like, I mean, I, we took first place. There was only three people in the category at the time. But now the flavored cheddar category is probably the largest category in all of American cheese society. So it's really become a, a thing. Next question. Next question. Can you share how the lavender is imparted into the rub? Is it fresh lavender, ground up or dried? It's very subtle, which is nice. Yep. So lavender really is there because coffee can be kind of bitter. And lavender kind of rounds out the bitterness of the coffee. And the way we did it when we first started trying to rub things, I'll go backwards. The reason we started rubbing cheese was out of necessity. We are in Utah and a very humid day in Utah, we all whine about it's like 36% humidity. So on a bad day in Utah, it can be 8% humidity. And you cannot age cheese in that in that environment. And so we had to figure out something to do that was interesting and different. And we came up with the technology of rubbing the rind with our different flavorings and seasonings. And that's kind of where it rolled out. But when we first started, it was hilarious. We took some water and we were making these like mud balls of coffee and we would smear them on the cheese. And it just it looked like like little kids playing with finger art. It just was horrible. And what we ultimately decided on is we'll take canola oil. We rub a very, very fine, thin layer of canola oil on the cheese. And then we rub the dry coffee on. Our coffee comes from Tim's brother. He roasts the coffee in Grand Junction, sends us the beans, freshly roasted. We grind the beans the morning of rubbing the cheese, which is the day we make it. And we take lavender flowers and we toss it in the burr grinder with the coffee beans and it gets ground up with the coffee. So it's an organic lavender and it's just super subtle. Some people don't get it, but if you are if you drink a red wine, it will make the lavender pop. So anyway, other questions? I like yeah, questions. You're, you're hitting up. What kind of coffee did you use? Uh, and are there cheeses I could use in a gift basket? So they'll have to remain refrigerated. Um, so a cheddar is very durable. I mean, it's, it's pretty tough. I mean, technically, according to a big study that was done up in Wisconsin, you can sell a cheddar per the Code of Federal Regulations up to 78 degrees, which is hot, right? We don't recommend that. It starts to get soft. Um, I don't know how long your cheese have been out, but it starts to get soft. It starts to sweat a little bit. Not super good. But any cheese, I mean, just to give you an idea, we age our cheese at 56 degrees. So you can definitely put these cheeses in baskets. Um, I would definitely have them in refrigeration, ship them under refrigeration, but they are very durable. They can last a long time. We're fortunate that way. Some cheeses are not that easily done. So I keep going. I'll just kind of show yes, you a sir. couple pictures. Pictures of there's our cows, our Jersey cows give us lots of cream. Um, there's our dairyman, fourth generation dairy. We love the guys and they love us. We buy a lot of milk from them. Um, lots of cows. So here's beehive cheese. We're just, here's our make room. We get a tanker of milk, we make cheese, and we get a tanker of milk the next day. So our milk comes in, it never sits more than about eight hours before it's made into cheese. So very fresh milk makes for really good, really good cheese. I'll just kind of show you a couple pictures. I won't go into all the details, but this is my favorite part of cheese making. So we pasteurize our milk. We add our cultures. The cultures are the bacteria that eat the sugars. They produce lactic acid and they also produce flavors. That's where the flavoring in cheese comes from after, and then you age it and lots more flavors are imparted. But then you add the rennet to the milk and the rennet is an enzyme that sets the curd. It's so cool. And it will take the vat of milk from liquid to this state right here in 30 minutes. It's the coolest thing ever. It's magic. And then what you do is you take a knife and you run it through the curd 
and then you turn it sideways and run it back through the slit that you've just made. And if the cheese is ready to be cut, it will run across the vat almost like an ice, like if you were to crack a lake and the ice split across, you'll be, you'll be able to tell that it's ready. You have about a two minute window on this step of the cheese making. If you cut it too early, you end up with too much moisture or too it's too dry. If you cut it too late, it ends up too moist. And so you kind of ruin the vat. So super cool step in the cheese making process. And then you cut the curd. These are harps. One is horizontal, one is vertical. You run it through the vat and you end up with quarter inch cubes of cheese. And those little cubes of cheese, we stir it, we pump it into the finishing table. This is kind of just a time-lapse transfer process, but we stir it and cook it. And then we end up, we drain the whey, all of our whey goes back to the dairy. They feed it to their cows because there's a lot of protein in the, in the whey. And then we drain the whey and we end up with a slab of cheese in the bottom of the cur in the bottom of the vat. And then these slabs, we flip over every 10 minutes for about two hours. And we're waiting for the pH to become just right. And we're waiting for the moisture to come out of the cheese. And then in order to, to slow down the acid production of the bacteria, because they're, they're in a perfect environment temperature-wise, they have all the sugar they could possibly want. And they are making acid by design at a very rapid rate, but we can't, we've got to slow down those bacteria from making too much acid or else they'll ruin our cheese. And the way we do that is we run the slabs through a cheese mill. These slabs go through this and it cuts it into curds. And then those curds, we stir around and we salt them and the salt stops the bacteria and it makes it so that they're happy. And then we poop up the cheese, we press it, we take it out of the press, and then this is how we rub it. We rub the canola oil on, and this was our Red Butte Hatch Chili. And there's our Queen Bee Porcini, so that'll take us into there. I'm gonna stop sharing screen. So um, Sheila talked about earlier how everybody just kinds of comes up with these crazy ideas. Um, Tim's idea was the, the barely buzzed. Mine was the sea hive, which was a honey and salt. My boy Oliver's was the queen bee porcini. He took some porcini mushrooms, he drew, ground them up, rubbed it on the cheese, and we entered this one at the World Cheese Awards uh, two years ago, and we ended up bringing home the only domestic super gold of the year. So that was a really big, big win for us. But this one, very simply, I tried the queen bee porcini with the bacon preserve. And it was, to me, it was fantastic. Just very simple. I also, my daughter will uh, agree, anything chocolate. I love chocolate with our cheese. Um, these are dark chocolate sea salt almonds. That was a really great pairing as well. And, but I, I went back to the way I started you guys. If you get to know, I always tell cheesemongers, get to know who you, the cheeses are that you're selling. Go Google them, reach out to them. Just say, hey, I sell your cheese. I want to get to know you. Do you have five minutes to talk on the phone? And we love it when we get to know our people that are selling our cheese. And, you know, my email is, it's very easy, pat at beehivecheese.com. If you guys ever have a question whatsoever, reach out and just say, hey, dude, they say, what are, what are you thinking? Or do you have any, do you want some ideas on my other daughter, our youngest daughter? She said, why don't you make a maple and rosemary cheese? And we're, we're r and d that as we speak. And it may turn out, it may not turn out, but you just never know until you, until you play with it. Questions, you guys, anything? I think you've hit up most of the questions, uh, but again, the mad scientist, you guys will try anything and like, but that's amazing. And I know not everything works, but like, if you keep throwing it at that, I call it throwing spaghetti at the wall. I don't know why, but if you keep throwing it at the wall, something will stick eventually. But I love the passion and being able to do that, trying something new and creating. I think that's absolutely amazing. Does anybody out there have any questions? 
everybody's just eating, hanging out, That's enjoying good. the afternoon, I think. Um, well, beautiful. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, Pat, Mark, uh, Sheila, thank you all so, so much. I'm going to say you. one more time, support these producers. These are family-run businesses. These, these are smaller producers that produce big things. Uh, tell these stories. Get these to your customers. Your customers will love them, and, uh, and we appreciate it. Stay tuned, as always, for more uh, virtual IDFs. We have another one coming up in August. Uh, so we will keep sending out tasting kits, keep educating whoever wants to learn. Um, this is recorded. If you missed it or you have a friend that you want to see it, uh, Institute Du Fromage on the YouTube. Uh, it'll be it'll be ready for that. Uh, and I'm going to put here if anybody has uh, any questions or comments, Snowdridge at gfifoods.com. If you need to get in touch with me, if you have suggestions, questions or comments, Please reach out if there's something you would like to see uh, on these IDFs in the future. Let me know. But thank you, Pat, again, uh, Mark, Sheila. Thank you all so much. And thank you to everybody who attended. I hope you have a very, very beautiful day. And try to share some of these snacks. Don't hoard them all to yourself, okay? Share it around. Thank you, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>